All right, guys. Hi, everyone. Um, so we are at the um the very last animal lab today. So um can someone give me a shout? Um can you see my screen with the uh, the vertebrate slide on? Yes. All righty. And guys, as usual, just to make this uh, more interactive, I would really like to ask you to turn on your cameras um, so that I feel less weird. All right, thank you guys. So um, we will talk about vertebrates first and then towards the end, I will tell you, remind you of what's happening next week. It's going to be the exams, right? Sorry, the practicals, right? And then we will quickly talk about um, those stuff, right? And, and, and again, I do appreciate those who are actually uh, on video. Thank you so much. Um, it feels weird enough uh, when I record lectures for, <laughs> for, uh, for classes um, by talking to a computer. I don't want to do it again when we are actually uh, in real time. All righty. So, um, and before we go on guys, I just wanted to take a quick um, update, not a verbal update. Uh, any questions regarding what is due today in terms of your family update, uh, the family basic information. Uh, I do have a couple of students who communicated with me, but I want to make sure that others are doing fine. If not, it's just a matter of, uh, uh, I will also uh, leave some time towards the end of the lab to ask questions. So keep that in your mind, right? You are working in groups. And um, if you have any questions, any clarification, please do ask. And I have uh, had uh, students asking really good questions. Uh, at the end of the previous lab. So I recorded that conversation. It's on the last five, 10 minutes in the recorded lab video, right? So if you want to check that out before you submit whatever you have today, go for it, right? Any question you have, please don't hesitate to ask. All right. So um, anything you want to uh, ask, mention anything regarding that? Well, seems like we are all set, that's good. So let's talk about vertebrates. It's a group of chordates, right? And then, um, so, and then we will also uh, talk about today, very basal animals. Now, please don't mix it up, right? I'm talking about vertebrates, right? The subphylum within phylum chordata, and then I'm going to very basal animals, right? So we are talking about two completely disparate, evolutionary disparate groups that are um, phylogenetically very distinct, evolutionary very distinct, but I'm grouping them together um, for logistic reasons, not because they actually belong together, right? So, do, um, so don't mix that up. Okay, so first of, let's talk about, um, let me point over here, about the evolutionary history, right? So, you know, like the basic, ba basal codates I'm talking, sorry, basal animals I'm talking to you today about, cnidarians and poriferans are actually way over here, literally on the base of the animal um, tree, right? Vertebrates are actually at the end Right, they actually more look how many branches, you know, there's fewer branching when it comes to cnidarians and porifera, right? Then and again, are cnidarians and porifera closely related? Not really, right? Um, and porifera, you can see clearly, is the outgroup, is the outgroup to all the other animals that we are studying, right? And then cnidarians are the outgroup to um all the protostomes, or, or rather, cnidarians are outgroup to all the bilaterally symmetrical triploblastic animals we are studying, right? That's actually really important to uh, notice that. L look what's happening, happen over here. The, the C is the trait that corresponds to bilaterally symmetrical triploblastic animals, right? So, um, right, so these guys, right? Um, are radially symmetrical, if you remember uh, from your lectures, and we will go over that today as well, right? So, um, cnidarians, again, are the outgroup to all triploblastic bilaterally symmetrical animals. Porifera or spongy are the outgroup to all the other animals, right? All the other animals, or in other words, all the animals with true tissue. 
right? Because, you know, porifera do not have a real tissue organization. Now, keep that in your mind very well. Uh, and then over here, the vertebrates, you know, like let's, if you trace back, right, um, you can see there are sister taxa to other codates, right? Other two non-vertebrate codates. And um, look at this feature over here, right? This characteristic, this particular trait, the vertebrates will have not a code for a particular part of their life cycle, a nerve code, pharyngeal gill slits, post anal tail, right? Now, those, all of these coded basal characteristics, right, or, or, or primary basal, basic coded characteristics, you know, will be present in vertebrates, but with very interesting modifications, right? And we will talk, we talked about that very briefly last time. Last time. We will revisit the same idea today. So, um, there are several key features that you see in this particular tree, right? Um, it's kind of a smaller group coming from here, right? It's like a sub uh, division of that. Um, so, uh, where are the codates? The codates, let me actually drag this thing it's all the way up here. Don't want it. So, um, the vertebrates are actually, as you can see over here. Now, I must mention, right? that um, whether these guys, right, the hagfish, whether they are a, actually a vertebrate or a non-vertebrate codate is still debated. There are several different research telling different things, right? But I, uh, I wanted to mention that over here, right? Um, that it's actually highly debated. In fact, we are still debating how do you connect these hagfish to the coded phylogenetic tree. Are they sort of a branch coming out of, uh, of uh, other uh, basal codates, basal non-vertebrate codates? Um, or are they actually among the most basal vertebrate animals? That's actually an active debate, which actually makes it really interesting. Now, let's focus on the rest of the vertebrates, right? Now, um, what kind of interesting features do we see over here? Right. First one I wanted to talk about is this particular feature, right? Um, evolution of, you know, the lobed fin actually happens in the vertebrate clade. Do all vertebrates have a lobed fin? No, only some of them do, right? Now, what is a lobed fin? That's an extremely important question. You know where it evolves. It evolves at this particular point, right? Within the quote unquote fish groups, right? Um, and that lobed fin is present in all of these groups, okay? All of these groups, right? Um, this is actually, you know, this includes um, lungfish, right? Involves coelacanth, right? Don't try to memorize this particular really weird name, right? Coelacanth. And then amphibians, reptiles, mammals, right? And when I say reptiles, it also includes birds. Now, remember this, it's a lobed fin, right? And you would ask me immediately, wait, I, I'm not surprised to hear about a fin in a fish, but are you telling that? Oh, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals also have a fin? Well, they do actually have a lobed fin, right? Or they are descendants, right, of a particular group that actually have evolved a lobed fin, right? What happens to the lobed fin? Many different things. In you and me, they actually become legs, right? In a, in a, in a bird, it became a, 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 a wing. Right in um, in certain reptiles, it became a limb. Some reptiles completely lost it. Right, amphibians, it became uh, the front pair of limbs. So they actually have oh, oh, amphibians. It became limbs, front and the back pair of limbs. Right. So a lobed fin is actually what you see in this particular diagram. Right. It's actually it's it's first of course it's just a fin. Right. But what happens inside of the fin is actually it contains bones and muscles. Right. What kind of bones do you see? If you look at the diagram, those fin, those bones are the exact set of bones that you find in you and me. Exact same set of bones that you find in any other mammal, amphibian or reptile or a bird. Right. So the bones, the skeletal elements inside the fin is actually um, the same across all the members in this particular, this particular clade. Right. And we actually, you can name them lobed fins, lobed finned 
clade, right? That's actually um, a uh, scientifically correct term to use. Now, and you can also see, like, I don't know whether you, how you learn this in high school, the term ostichthyes, the bony fish, right? Are you a bony fish? You are essentially a bony fish because, you know, you contain bones in your skeleton, in your uh, limbs, right? And then, um, and then uh, moving onwards, uh, th that's actually why um, taxonomically speaking or phylogenetically speaking, you know, everything with fins that swim in water, those are not the only fish, right? You cannot scientifically categorize all quote unquote fish, right? Into a particular taxonomic unit, right? Because they actually are not as, th those fish themselves do not make um, a separate taxonomic clade. So, uh, another character that I wanted to talk about is actually um, the limb structure, the pentadactyl limb, right? Um, so limbs with digits, that actually evolved in this particular tetrapod group, right? Tetrapods include amphibians, reptiles, and birds, and mammals, right? So limbs with digits, not just limbs, right? Insects have had limbs, okay? Um, Many arthropods actually have had limbs, right? Um, and if you remember from echinoderms, their arms in certain uh, literature are considered quote unquote limbs, right? So you have to mention it's limbs with digits, right? Separate digits, fingers and toes. Um, other characters that I want you to understand that is very important within the vertebrate group is actually that, right? Uh, th this is actually the, uh, the pentadactyl uh, limp pattern in detail, right? All of these groups that you see, right, actually have that pentadactyl pattern, right? Um, whales, bats, frogs, birds, you know, uh, carnivores, reptiles, humans, they all have the same skeletal elements in their limbs. Um, this particular part is actually the amniotic egg, right? I mean, if you wonder what does that mean? Okay, first, where do you find this amniotic egg? That is common to this particular group that includes reptiles, birds, and amphibians, uh, and, and, and mammals, reptiles, birds, and mammals, right? Amniotic egg. Amphibians do not have an amniotic egg. Now, there's a difference between amniotic egg and an egg, right? Amniotic egg actually has extra embryonic membranes, right? What does that mean? Now, my goal is not for you to memorize those extra embryonic membranes and what they do for the lab, right? Um, for the lab, what I want you to know is that amniotic egg has multiple additional protective membranes that perform different functions to protect and to nourish um, the embryo, developing embryo. It helps and safeguard the development of the embryo, right? That's what ex amniotic membranes do. That's what an amniotic egg does, right? And in an in a amphibian, you don't see those additional uh, membranes, right? And then for, just for your information for the lab, I included this diagram, which tells you those different um, uh, membranes and what they do, right? The yolk sac, I haven't listed the functions, I mean, you can guess what that is for feeding, right? All right, let's move on. Um, oh, I think I can wrap this over here. Right, right. Um, so talking about these different characteristics, remember notochord, nerve cord, gill slits, post tail, right? And we did discuss that those coded characteristics um, and and how do you actually describe them? You know, like where do you find them and what their function really is, right? You know, we, we already went over that part. So those are important even in this particular component. And then, okay, that's a codate. So what sets a vertebrate apart from other non-vertebrate codates? Mm. So they have those four coded character, those four basic coded characteristics I just went over, right? But they may not be those characteristics that I just went over may not be observable throughout their life period, throughout their life cycle, right? It could be limited to larval stages. In certain cases, it could be only it could be limited to embryonic stages, 
right? Developing, uh, you know, may, maybe only in the fetus, maybe only in the um, embryo inside the leg, in, inside of an egg, right? Um, in certain cases, you never physically observe them, right? Observe those uh, characteristics and, um, and certain characteristics, they might actually become heavily modified. Certain characteristics um, disappear entirely, right? So remember that, because that's actually a key character, key point to a uh, note. Um, and then vertebrates have a segmented backbone separated by vertebral discs that are derived from notochord. Now, that's actually a very important point. Word, in vertebrates, right, what happened to the notochord? Notochord does not stay as that single solid rod extending the entire length of the body, right? What happens is it's actually become a vestigial structure, right? If it is vestigial, you should have some remnants. The remnants of the vertebra of the notochord is actually those discs, right? Um, remember, like in your spinal, in your vertebral column. Right, vertebral column is composed of a series of bones. Each each bone is called what? Vertebrae, right? So in between those vertebrae, you actually have a cartilaginous disc that gives flexibility to your vertebral column, right? Now those cartilaginous discs that you find in between vertebrae are actually the remnants of the notochord, right? So that's so 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 the one of the key vertebrate character is actually having a vertebral column that is comprised of multiple segments of bones interspaced by a disc, right? Um now vertebrates are actually um is a group with with an old code that show very clear signs of cephalization. Now um cephalocordates did have a clear head, right? They have a clear um portion that you can call the head, but in vertebrates, the cephalization becomes extremely pronounced, right? You can clearly see a head with concentration of sensory organs, right? Concentration of um, central nervous system, right? Um, and also, you know, a presence of um, the feeding apparatus, right? All of those happens in vertebrates. Now, remember, cephalization is not, if is not unique to vertebrates, right? Insects, arthropods, right, have shown some cephalization. Annelids showed some cephalization. But what happens over here is the same feature re-evolves in a much more pronounced way, right, in vertebrates. Central nervous system is not unique to vertebrates, not even unique to all the codates, right? So, but what happens in vertebrates is actually it became reorganized and become more pronounced. It became more functionally um, better equipped to modulate uh, sensory functions, to modulate motor functions, to coordinate movements, to interpret signals coming from the environment, right? Um, so we did talk about what happens to these coded features in humans, so I'm not going to go over that uh, again. Um, so now let's actually talk about the very basic, the, the very basal animals, starting with sponges, phylum porifera. Right. Um, so these guys actually, like I mentioned with respect to the phylogenetic tree, they do not have true tissues, right? Um, now, certain scientists who study this group of animals, right, they actually consider their epidermis, pinacoderm is the external um, layer of cells, right? Uh, and the mesohyle as some sort of a tissue organization. There is some debate going on whether we can consider that as a tissue. Um, but as of now, we don't, right? There are, I, I, and I'll tell you immediately why not well, after I explain uh, what mesohyle is. So pinacoderm is the same as epidermis. I personally don't like the term epidermis because epidermis by definition is a true tissue, right? And then uh, mesohyle or mesohyle is actually the space in between the external layer of cells and the internal most layer of cells, right? Now that mesohyle contains a lot of really cool stuff. Um, let me see actually if I have a diagram. Yeah, I will explain that part in the previous, in the next sli slide. Now, why we don't consider pinacoderm or mesohyle as 
a true tissue a true tissue by definition I, I don't know give me a shout how many of you have taken any class on animal physiology or um and any anatomy class in high school or uh, in college or in in your associate degree anyone yeah i didn't think you would because you are still early in your stages um so a true tissue actually is a a proper organization of multiple cells and that organization makes distinct anatomical units make distinct morphological unit makes di distinct functional units right um because of this cellular organization in a tissue right each individual cells cannot function independent from other cells right so these kind of organized cellular aggregations work in coordination in tandem with uh, each other right it's it's not a single cell does operate on its own but it, it is not effective unless it coordinates itself with other um cells within the same tissue right so the functional unit will not operate properly by each individual cell working on their own, right? The coordination is extremely important. We don't see that level of cellular aggregation or that level of coordination in the outer layer of cells in porifera or the inner layer of cells or in the mesohyle. You don't see that. What you see is each cell doing their own thing, right? So that is actually why um, scientifically or biologically, um, I would, uh, like most of us argue that sponges do not have through tissues, period, right? Um, choanocytes is actually a unique type of cell you only find in porifera. This is a choanocyte, right? What its job is actually, you know, by beating this flagellum, it draws, the flagellum draws a water current into this particular collar part of the cell. And collar is like a funnel that funnels everything in the, uh, every suspended particle in water and pushes it towards the cell. And the cell itself actually has a phagocytosis capacity. Right? Do you know what phagocytosis is? Phagocytosis is literally a cell surrounding other stuff, food particles and ingesting, right? It's like a cell eating other stuff, right? Um, that's how some of the cells in your immune system defend you, right? By eating um harmful stuff right and then the digestion happens inside and then digested parts are actually passed onto cells in mesohyle called amoebocyte now geranocytes again is very unique to porifers to sponge right you don't find that anywhere else um there are geranocyte like unicellular animal unicellular organisms okay but that's not a genocide, that's an animal, it's an entire unicellular animal. So that's why genocides are considered unique characteristics for porifera. Um, and if you look at the entire body, they actually have multiple incurrent canals, right? Can you see my green, blue arrows that are actually pointing into this particular cavity, right? The cavity is called spongiosil, right? Um, so water moves through these incurrent canals into the cavity, into the spongiosil. Inside the spongiosil, um, these choanocytes feed, collect food, and then after that, whatever that is, um, after feeding, the water leaves the sponge through the excurrent canal or the osseculum, right? I don't really care what word you really use over there. Use simple words, incurrent, excurrent. That's more meaningful and easy to remember. In, current comes in, excurrent goes out. Mesohyle, like I mentioned what that is, it's a gelatinous matrix, right? Very fluidic matrix that actually, uh, in which many other types of cells are suspended, right? And since, those cells are very loosely suspended in the mesohyle. Those cells can move around, right? For example, amoebocytes are actually cells that move within mesoglia like an amoeba. Um, spicules, that's a really interesting thing, right? The yellow stuff that you see over here, right, are actually the spicules. And, it, and those are very microscopic structures. If you look, on, look underneath a scanning electron microscope, they look like this. They, they come in very different shapes, sizes, right? The job of the spicule is to provide strength, right? Um, and maintain the shape of the sponge, right? It's kind of acts like a skeleton, 
right? Again, uh, those uh, those uh, um, spicules hinge with each other? No. Do they fuse with each other? No, right? So it does not function as a rigid skeleton that you see in other animals, but it provides support, helps maintain shape. Um, these animals are non-symmetrical. They do not have any body symmetry. You cannot cut them across any plane to two identical halves. Don't have a coelom. The sponge seal is not a true body cavity, right? True body cavities exist between um, germinal layers. These guys don't have a true body cavity, so they are not coelomic. They do filter feed with their choanocytes. Um, they have both male and female reproductive capacity inside one individual. They can reproduce sexually through external fertilization and asexually as well. Um, they actually also have larval stages present, right? After fertilization happens externally, the zygote develops into a larvae, right? And the larvae is actually free swimming while adults are sedentary, right? Sedentary, me, uh, Sessile meaning staying on one place. So um, this diagram is simply for when you study, for you to understand what are the functions performed by different components within a sponge, right? And I did explain all of these uh, earlier. This one is actually an electronic microscopic image of the choanocytes, right? Um, Again, the, the point of this diagram is kind of to help you understand how they work. It's, I'm not expecting you to know everything in this particular one. Things that I want you to know, I explained in the previous slide. Um, so yeah, like for example, only thing I want to point out again is this one is the mesohyle, the in-between layer. This one that is actually um, also known as epidermis, is actually the, what I call is, is the uh, pinacodermis, right? It's the external most layer, right? And then internally, you have a lot of these um, choanocytes, right? And then these pores or ca in current canals helps water being taken up in, right? And then um, through this particular hole, that water leaves out. So amoebocytes are kind of, you know, helping to transport stuff right back and forth, transporting food back and forth, but in particularly transporting food, right? Um, right, let's move on. Next, um, we have to go through different um, types of sponge, right? So um, the first class is calcarea. Now try to interpret that name calcarea. Calcarea means calcium compounds, right? Calcium-based minerals. So that group contains um, spongy, with spicules that are made out of calcium carbonate, okay? So calcarea, right? And this is, a, the, the picture is one example, right? It's actually Sycon is the genus name for them. And then a second class is actually, this particular group is pretty interesting because they are very tall. And these class, th these guys, these sponges, they have spicules and you can see, uh, how uh, spicules have arranged themselves. They kind of make that mesh work, right? If you look at them. And, um, and so, so they kind of lay the foundation for a mesh work and then other cells organize around that so-called mesh work, right? So that's why they actually have this really cool um, net-like appearance in them, right? So those spicules in these guys are made out of silicon material, like right? made out of silica, the same stuff that uh, you find in glasses. Right. Um, Dermospongy is actually the sponge that you guys might know in generally, like in, in English, when you call the spongy, right, or a porifera. These are the guys you might actually have seen in documentaries, right? Um, have you seen the actual bath sponges that they sell, like that are made out of these animals? Not the, the artificial sponge, right? The actual bath sponge that you can buy in the market are made out of these. Um, uh, demo spongy by what they do is they harvest the spongy and then you dry it right <laughs> when you dry it all the other live tissues deteriorate leaving the spicules intact right and then the spicules start fusing with each other when the other tissues disintegrate and you get uh, all of a sudden you you left with this you know really weird looking sponge so um so in these guys 
they actually have a much more harder scale, you know, the uh, uh, spicule arrangement. Um, but in live animals, that, that that arrangement is covered by softer live tissue that are made out of protein material, right? Um, all right, that's actually about these guys. Now let's move on to cnidarians. Um, in literature, right, or historically, we use the term celenterates. We don't use that term anymore. I, I really hate when people switch the names, but um, we, I prefer to stick to the term Nideria. But FII, silenterate is another term that we historically use for these guys. Um, these guys also have a very unique type of cell called nidocytes. And this is actually an electron microscopic photograph of a nidocyte, right? So inside the nidocyte, you notice something called nidos. Uh, Nematocyst, right? So, nematocyst is actually the this barbed apparatus, right? That you see inside a nematocyst, right? Uh, inside a nidocyte, right? Now, how does this look like? Well, when it is stored, you, it doesn't look like anything. When it is when when that particular uh, structure is kept inside the cell, it doesn't look like anything. The cool part is when it is triggered, right? When, when any other animal touches this particular trigger, right? It's literally setting off a you know, trigger. And this internal structure, the um, nematocyst is now ejected outside. When it is ejected outside, it looks like this, right? Here, what you see over here is actually a discharged nematocyst again. Nidocyte is the entire cell, right? And then uh, nematocyst is actually this particular structure that is housed inside the nidocyte, right? And, and the nematocyst is nothing, but simply it's a barbed, something like a barbed string or a barbed rope, right? And these barbs, you know, are multiple spines, right? That can actually latch onto another animal, right? And what else does it contain? It's actually, it contains poison, right? It actually injects a poison, a extremely fatal, deadly poison into another animal. So these structures, these nidocytes, because of its um, ability to inject venom and its ability to trigger immediately are used for two purposes. One is to capture food. Two is to protect yourself, right? And in fact, um, I, I don't know how many of you have any bad experience in the beach, Anyone been stung by a jellyfish? Good, <laughs> good, uh, it's not pleasant. Um, certain jellyfish, particularly comb jellies, are actually extremely, could be fatally toxic, but um, a normal uh, true jelly sting is not that harmful, but you, you get the weird feeling, right? You get a really painful sensation um, wherever it got stung. Right, and it takes time for that to disappear. So it's not a pleasant uh, experience that you are going to have if you get stung by a jellyfish. Um, so what happens when you get stung by a jellyfish is actually, uh, you know, you are getting loaded with, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of these um, nidocytes. Um, these guys have true tissues. Right, they are among the first group of animals that develops true tissues. They have an external epithelium. They have muscles. Right, and they have nerves. Right? They have a diffuse nerve, uh, nervous system. Right, and in fact, uh, some of them even have sensory organs, like you know those that are uh, sensitive to light. Um, they do have in between their um, epidermis and the endoderm. Right, they actually have this mesoglea. Right, which is a a fluidic gelatinous structure um, material that does not contain a whole lot of living tissue, except for some reproductive cells that, 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 kind, that you find um, embedded inside it. But the, the gelatinous material itself is non-living, right? It's proteinous material, right? It, it's, it's a combination of organic and inorganic material um, that itself is non-living, but there are reproductive organs, reproductive cells, and many other cells embedded in the mesoglea that are living. They are diploblastic, as you can see, that's endoderm and the ectoderm, right? So mesoglea is not coming from mesoderm, 
right? It's not, period. Um, there are, if you look into their life cycle, they do have life cycles with variable complexities. You can clearly see two adult-like stages, right? Ex aside from the larval stages, aside from other developmental stages, they, their adults could be either, you know, a polyform or a medusa form. And some Cnidarians have both polyps and medusa, right? A polyp, it looks like this, right? It has um, kind of a body, like a trunk, right? And then a crown that contains tentacles, right? And the mouth is found on the top of that crown, surrounded by tentacles. This is a really interesting part. I will come back to this later. Um, and a medusa looks like an inverted polyp with a shorter trunk, right? Um, so where you find the tentacles again around the the rim, right? And they also have multiple arms, right? That are coming that that, that uh, surrounds the mouth, right? Um, it's kind of a in, Medusa anatomically is looks like an inverted polyp, right? And then subsequently undergoing few uh, some levels of uh, organ reorganization. Okay. Um, Yeah, and, and then again, I, I mentioned they are both adult-like stages, meaning they both can actually engage in sexual reproduction. They both can produce um, male or female reproductive organs and then uh, produce exosperms, right? Um, in terms of lifestyle, they are carnivores, they are predators, right? Um, what The size of the prey they ingest could be highly variable and some Nidarians, some jellyfish, can actually eat fish. So now let's talk about very briefly different classes of Nidarians, starting with Anthozoa. Um, the example is actually coral reefs and sea animal. Um, yeah, coral reefs and sea animal. And, and, and sea animal is in the picture, right? Let's take a look over here. So the characteristic that I want you to know for this particular class for the lab is that in their life cycle, they don't have a Medusa stage, period, right? They only have a polyp stage, right? Examples, the one that you probably know are actually the sea animals, right? The ones that you may not suspect is actually corals, right? Corals are actually anthosoan cnidarians, right? And then there are several cool examples I'm going to show you. Everybody know what a sea animal is, right? And that's actually one type of a sea animal. Um, a coral reef, right, is comprised of many different species of um, anthosoans. A uh, tree coral that looks like a literally like a tree underwater. Um, sea fans that actually branches multiple times on a single plane, right, are anthosoans. This weird thing, sea pen is actually a Nidarian belonging to the group Anthozoa, right? Um, and what you see actually, you might ask, okay, wait, 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 wait. Where are the actual polyp in this, right? Look at the red stuff over here. Like this guy is a polyp, clearly. I don't have to explain that. In here, right, the actual tree like structure is the calcium carbonate skeleton. Um, the actual polyp is actually the red stuff you see all around the white skeleton, right? Here, the yellow part is actually the quote unquote the calcium carbonate skeleton, right? The very thin flimsy stuff you see, um, the reddish stuff you see around that is actually the polyp, right? Same over here, right? The, um, the structure itself is actually not the polyp. The polyps are at the at these branches on the tips of these branches or surrounding those branches you see the actual polyp right um that is actually one of the weirdest things i have ever seen for an idarian called c pansy right um this particular structure right is used for the purpose of anchoring onto the substrate right and in real life if you see them in the wild you externally observe only this part right this is like going to be embedded. And if you look closer, the polyps appear like this. Look at that, right? And yep, that's actually basically yeah, it for the anthozoan. Cubozoa, the second class of cnidarians, um, has both medusa forms and polyp forms, but 
Medusa form is more dominant. Um, they are very effective and successful predators. They are very good at swimming, right? They can swim very gracefully and very fast and slowly whenever they need to do that, right? They swim by pulsating this dome-like thing, right? And they can beat their tentacles um, to further assist and, and, and coordinate um, their movements. They feed a lot on fish. They are predators, right? They, um, these tentacles are armed with thousands of nidocytes, right? And inside the nidocytes, you have these nematocysts, right? They're extremely uh, highly potent. Now, you might survive an attack from a through jelly, but an attack by a box jelly is extremely fatal, right? Quite fatal, right? Um, now, in this picture, can you see these, you know, tiny, tiny, tiny stuff on all over the animal? Those are actually extremely large nidocytes, right? That contains a nematocyst that can actually sting you, right? Um, and these things you see in this uh, box jelly are actually reproductive organs, right? Um, Anything else cool about these guys other than they are deadly? I can't think of anything right now. No, this is good enough, right? So uh, Skyphosoa, the, uh, the other group of Nidarians, other class of Nidarians, they too have both Medusa and polyp forms. Again, Medusa is dominant, right? Just like in the Cubozoans. In fact, uh, only difference I want you to know between Cubozoa and Skyphosoa is actually that these guys, they are dome, the top part, right, this particular part is more square-ish, like a cube. That's why they are called cubozoa, right? That's, that's actually the only thing I want to know in terms of their differences between skyphozoa and cubozoa, right? In skyphozoa, right, the dome, the top part is actually more round or circular, right? And they are, in English, they are called true jellies. As you can see in these diagrams, right, they are... Uh, in their life cycle, the most dominant form is Medusa. When I say most dominant, what does it, what what do I mean by that? In their life cycle, in their in their entire life cycle, the greater proportion of their time in the life cycle is spent as a Medusa, right? Um, and it is actually the Medusa that can sexually reproduce in these guys. The same over here, it is the Medusa that can uh, sexually reproduce in these guys, right? Their polyp form is mostly used for asexual reproduction and spend a very short time in their uh, life cycle. All right, and, 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 and th these guys, you know, come in very different sizes. They are very large animals, extremely huge, uh, ginormous animals. Um, Hydrozoa is, an is actually one of the uh, most interesting group as, as far as I am concerned, um, because in them, they have both Medusa and polyp forms, but unlike other groups we talked about, their polyps are the dominant stage, right? And polyps in involve themselves in sexual reproduction. The other, the most unique part is out of all the Nidarians, they actually have the most complex life cycle. The life cycle in here is not for you to memorize. Uh, for the lab, it's not in the lecture. In my lecture, I don't make you memorize that either, but I put it over there to understand how complex their life cycle is, right? How different each life cycle stage perform different functions, right? And, um, they have extremely diverse body forms. Although it's polyp dominant, polyps takes different forms and, 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 and in fact have different functions. Um, this is the most simple forms of hydrozoans, hydra, right? Um, so just before I continue on, since we are finishing up the Nidarians, any of you who you are comic geeks, right? Like myself, anyone can remember, uh, the Hydra versus uh, uh, two animals that actually can be related to one of the um, comic movies. Anyone who's a fan of DC comics? Ah, forget it, right? So actually the, the, the point is actually, you know, uh, Hydra and the Medusa are actually are two characters that are DC comics have used um, because they look extremely weird, right? 
And some of the stuff um, that are attributed to the actual DC comic characters have a biological meaning, right? So I just wanted to mention that. I wouldn't go any further because if you're not familiar with those, um, it's just confusing. And um, like I mentioned, they comes in very different body forms, right? That is actually a, a Orton pipe hydroid, right? And some forms are colonial. Obelia, for example, is actually a colonial hydroid, right? Um, so a live organism looks like that, almost looks like a plant, like an algae. But if you, and if you look closely, the actual polyp is found on the tips of these branches, right? Looks like this. Um, and there are many, and, and, and Obelia is actually an attached sessile colony, but some hydroid colonies or hydrozoan colonies are actually mobile, free floating, right? That guy, is Portuguese man of war. It's another colonial form. And it's really interesting in these colonies, different polyps have undergone uh, modifications to perform different functions. Some polyps are equipped for reproduction. Some polyps are equipped for defense. Some polyps are equipped for food gathering. Some polyps are equipped to make this floating, this floating device, right? Which actually filled with air. So it actually floats on the top. Right. So in actually in water, when you see them in, in this ocean, you what you see is not the bottom, the top. Right. Yeah. And, and if you see that, run away. Yeah. They can sting you. And that is extremely bad. All right. Any questions regarding the very uh, the basic early lectures? Good. Now let's move on to the more interactive one. Right. So this one again, like, you know, when I ask questions, please do. Uh, answer and uh, talk with me, right? So um, first, uh, the key, right? Um, give me a, a yay or nay and a nod or a nod. Um, are you, shall I do one example with you guys or are you good by this stage, good enough to go by yourself for the key? I mean, I'm good at least. I don't know about anybody else. Okay, I, 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 I see a thumbs up to go ahead. So you are good. That's what I get. Okay, let's actually skip the key. And this is actually a very easy key to uh, go on, right? Um, right. Now, um, so this moving on to the second exercise, it's actually looking at the frog's anatomy, internal and external. Watch those videos. And, and then do this part that is actually going to be a part of your lab um, notebook, right? So for the frog, I'm, I'll quickly go over regarding food the, in terms of their uh, foraging and food habits. Um, don't forget to miss, uh, list the entire, all the set of organs in the digestive system. You know, they are, uh, frogs are largely insectivorous or you can say carnivorous, right? There are some frogs that are omnivorous that actually largely are carnivorous that they also feed on plant material. Um, now the frog larvae, by the way, are actually 100% herbivorous, except a handful of frog larvae can be carnivorous and cannibalistic. There's a few of them that are carnivorous and cannibalistic, but most tadpoles, right, are um, herbivorous. They feed on algae. They, they are graces, right? Um, and they have a complete digestive tract, right? Uh, starting from a mouth, esophagus, stomach, you know, small intestine, large intestine, or uh, anus. So, and they, have, uh, uh, they undergo digestion inside the digestive tract and absorb whatever they digested. Movements, well, for a frog, they have, you know, um, they can actually either swim or jump slash leap, right? Uh, if you are looking at toads, they hop, but we are not talking about toads. We are talking about frogs, right? They actually have this well-developed limbs, particularly their um, legs. The hind limbs are much longer than the fore limbs. So they actually help them to jump and to leap longer distances. Um, tadpoles have a tail, right? And frogs, adults absorb that particular tail. Uh, and tadpoles also have a fin around their tail. Um, and both have muscles to uh, help movement, like right? well-developed, strong muscles. And even if you look at adults, they have antagonistic muscles that actually uh, operate um, 
in tandem to move organs back and forth, right? To move limbs back and forth. And then, um, da -da 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 -da. and do not forget that frogs can swim too. To acid sw swimming, frogs actually have webbed feet, right? Um, and then skeletal structure, they have internal cal uh, calcified, uh, mineralized skeletons, right? Uh, a part or partially mineralized skeletons because many frogs actually have a lot of cartilage and stuff in their skeleton. Um, and then of course, they also have a cranium, which is a really interesting vertebrate character. A cranium is the, the part of the skeleton that protects your brain, right? Um, and reproductive, in terms of reproduction, well, their sexes are separate, right? Um, frogs in general can undergo either internal or external fertilization. You know, what type depends on what species. A lot of frogs undergo external fertilization, right? Um, where the male lay eggs after being, you know, after copulation, and then the uh, the female lays eggs after copulation, right? Uh, and then the male spreads sperms on the top. Um, so largely external, but there are some species that are internal, undergo internal fertilization. Um, for circulation and respiration, they have several organs they use for respiration. Can someone tell me what kind of organs frogs have for respiration? Skin. Correct. That's actually a very good answer. They do use skin a lot for respiration. What else? Do they have lungs, guys? That thing. They do, in 100% correct. They do have lungs. Um, and as a larvae, they have external gills, okay? Adults do not have gills, right? Um, now, there are some weird salamanders that actually have external gills, right? But that's a very, very weird situation. But frogs do not maintain external gills as adults. Larvae, they do. Um, circulation? Um, they do have a circulatory system um, and their circulatory system is actually cl a closed circulatory system, right? Um, where the blood circulation is within blood vessels in the heart, right? And moving on, there are lots of other organs that, um, that we will go through them when we talk about the systems um, and also do not forget to list the phylum level characteristics. Right, which actually I have already gone over. Now let's look at the frog, frog's external anatomy. Again, I have listed what organs, organ systems that I expect you to know. Um, and then of course the internal uh, organs and organ systems that I expect you to know. Um, so the orientation of the body, right? Um, the, so if I put a frog on a dissecting tray, just like that, and if I ask you to look at it from the top, what, what plane is this? What view is this? Dorsal. Very good, excellent, right? And the front of the body? Anterior. Very good, and then the, the back of the body, the rear? Is it posterior? Very good, excellent. That's posterior, right? And the belly side? Ventral. Ventral, very good, excellent, excellent, right? And yeah, this is actually ventral, right? Um, so the, I mean, this actually, I'm going to give you the answers. This is actually the head part, right? <laughs> and what we may not be, um, maybe new to you is this part, which is actually either the trunk or the torso. Torso is a better better term to use, right? Torso, right? Um, and now these are important things to know. Somebody make a uh, you know tell me this particular area to which the front limbs are attached to, right? What what kind of an area is this, or what kind of a girdle is this? Both girdles start with the letter P. What the muscles you find on the chest, what muscles do you call them? Pectoral. Very good, excellent, right? So this is actually the pectoral area or the pectoral region, right? And if that is pectoral, the leg attachment, what is that? Pelvic. 
Very good, excellent. That's the pelvic area or the pelvic region or the pelvic girdle. Um, so frogs empty um, their reproductive cells, um, excretory system and the digestive system into one big chamber that actually temporarily contains all of that. And that particular opening or that particular chamber is what? Anyone want to make a guess? This is the same name we learn for other animals that actually a common chamber that holds everything. Cloaca. Very good, excellent. Cloaca is the chamber, cloacal opening is actually the opening, right? Um, now frog, frogs actually, they have distinct digits in the front limb, right? Some, amphi some frogs actually have webbing around them, but most of them do not, right? Um, and then in the hind limb, they also have digits, but those digits are actually connected to each other by webbing, right? The number of toes are different between front versus hind limbs. Front, you have usually four. In the hind, you usually have five. Um, now, particular structures, let's actually try to um, test your knowledge by reading your lab manual, right? So on the eye, right? Except for the eyelid, there is another covering, a transparent covering that protects the eye. What do you call that? The flap. Mm, not really. There's a name for that. It's the hard to pronounce. The retina? No, retina is actually the layer you find. The cornea. The, the cornea. On top of the cornea. You are getting anatomically closer. So retina is the the one that creates the image. Cornea is actually in front of the lens, right? So um, so these guys don't have a quote unquote quote, cornea. They have something on, on I top. Have, sorry. I have no clue if I can pronounce this correctly, but nicotating membrane? Actually, you pronounce it right. <laughs> it is nicotating membrane. Good job. And now... Nicotating membrane is actually sort of a protective covering that protects the actual eye. It's transparent because of that. They don't have to move the nicotating membrane to see, right? And uh, nicotating, nicotating, I, again, I never care how you pronounce it. Um, now, this particular stuff, right, that actually opens, you know, creates an opening a uh, very short canal like opening to their sinuses. What is that, Emily? A nair? Very 50% correct. It is actually external nares or external nostrils, right? And then what is this? It helps them to hear. Is it like? Time phantom. Very something? good. That's correct. Timphanum. Timphanum or tympanic membrane. A simple English word for that. What do you call it? Ear. Ah, uh, ear is actually an entire structure that has tympanum and other stuff. What do you call it? Like for, for ear drum. Ear exactly. That this is nothing different. In you, it's actually way deeper in your ear right? In this guy, it's actually supervision, right? So in, in your case, it's so deep for the protective purposes. In these guys, it's, it's externally located. Yeah. Well, team phantom is the correct scientific term, right? Nictating membrane. We actually just call all of, all of this. We will jump to this one. Now, what we are looking at over here is a stained sec cross section of the amphibian skin, right? Now, amphibian skin has two major components, right? Um, this particular, the most superficial part that actually has a uh, very uh, uh, few layers, right? Is actually epidermis, right? The epidermis of the frog is live, okay? Unlike you and me, you know, we actually have 90% of, of our epidermis is dead, except for the very basal layer. In these guys, actually, it's, it's rather alive. Right, um, and think about why. Uh, you should know the answer. Can someone tell me why in us the epidermis is largely dead and in amphibians it is alive? Because they use it for respiration. Exactly the reason. One hundred percent. That is the reason. Right. Um, if it is dead, it will not let gas pass through. Right. 
What is the downside of epidermis being alive? Or in other words, why it is dead in you and me and in uh, reptiles? You always have to keep it moist. Exactly, that's the reason, right? Um, you will dry out if you have a live cell layer as the epidermis, but you can keep it moist continuously and still have um, a, a, a live uh, epidermis, right? So these guys, in order to keep a moist skin, they actually have this mucus glands, right? That are actually much closer from the anatomical position to the skin, right? Um, and if you look closely, what happens is there are, there are lots of column-shaped cells you know, on the uh, lining of the gland, and then there is a lumen, a cavity uh, inside. So all the mucus is secreted to this cavity by the cells, and then that mucus is then um, taken up by a mucus duct to the top of the skin, right? And, and that happens continuously. Mucus is 70 to 90% water, and the rest of the component is different types of proteins. Um, and it has a protective function too, because some of the proteins um, can uh, have uh, antimicrobial properties. In fact, they also secrete um, highly complex peptides that are not exactly an antibody, but very close to an antibody that has protective functions. Um, now, this other much large humongous glands that you located that you find little deeper in the skin right in the embedded in the dermis is actually poison glands okay um these poison glands actually um are also secreted on the top of the skin and that actually uh, helps them to prevent predation what happens is if your dog or a cat grabs one of these frogs it immediately triggers releasing of poison and the, the impact of poison is kind of gives a caustic burning sensation through the predator and they immediately let the thing go, right? So that's actually how it happens. Um, the poison glands are filled with granules. Those are poison granules, right? Um, the other stuff you see that are important for you to know is actually this, this flatter reddish stuff, this, this, and that. Right, that are like pinky red or lighter red colored, um, those are actually blood vessels. Now, why are not, why aren't they circular? That's because when you prepare a slide, the vessels collapse, right? In real anatomy, they are circular in cross section. Those are blood vessels. That why do you need why do you think they require so many blood vessels right next to the epidermis? Why? To carry that oxygen back. 100% correct. That is to support, to, to absorb oxygen and also to, to uh, give away carbon dioxide. The last part is actually these much more darker colored cells, right? That have very different shapes that looks like a starfish in their shape, actually. Those are called chromatophores. Chromatophores are color producing cells that actually creates, produce a color to the amphibian skin, which helps them camouflage. Right. Um, now this one actually, I won't. I have explained all the uh, the components, so I, I I want you to do this yourself and uh, fill in the blanks. All right. Um, sex determination is really important thing to know. Um, with, uh, for frogs. Now these sex determination characteristics I'm about to explain to you. Um, some of them can be applied for any frog right, or almost any frog. Some of them can be only applied to certain species. The tympanum size, right, if the tympanum is in, in diameter is the same size of the eye or smaller than the eye, you are looking at a female, right? If the tympanum is actually larger than the diameter of the eye, you are looking at a male. Now that can be undeniably used for any bullfrog. In for green frog, right? Not so much for most of the other species. So keep that in your mind. The next characteristic that I'm explaining you, um, this feature, the having um, presence or absence of an additional thumb pad, right? Look at this humongous base of the thumb in the front limb, right? Versus this much smaller thumb 
in this one, right? So the smaller thumb base, female, larger thumb base, male, additional pads on the thumb, like this huge callus, right? Versus absence of that over here, right? Um, so this guy with a callus, with a thumb, additional thumb pad, you are looking at a male. Absence of that, you are looking at a female. That character is universally applicable for any, any, any frog. In fact, can be even applied for a toad. What is the difference between a frog and a toad? By the way, I don't know whether I mentioned, I, you know, one of the groups that I extensively study are amphibians, right? So um, what is the difference between a frog and a toad, guys? Um, I think frogs are usually like, their skin is like usually smoother. Correct. That's actually a correct answer. Um, frog skin is usually smoother and wetter, moist. Toad skins are drier and more granular and coarser, right? If you touch a frog, you feel the slime, right? If you touch a toad, you feel warty, right? Like kind of a rough skin. Fun fact. If you handle a toad, do you get warts? Do, can they transmit warts, which is actually a disease, from them to you? Want to take a stab? Anyone? Um, I, don't, I don't think so. Correct. The, the, it's actually, I don't know whether you heard about that. That's a widely whole held belief. Um, in fact, I had students in my research lab and in, and in my classes who actually thought they do. Right. So um, if you don't believe, look at me. Right. I have handled toads for I don't know how long in my life. I don't have any. Right. Because warts are a, a viral disease. Right. You know, frogs cannot transmit it. And frogs don't have actual warts. They don't have that actual disease. Right. Uh, the wartiness is actually the appearance of their skin. Now, again, I just want to show you different diagrams, right? In a male, right? You have this very clear uh, thumb pad. It's also called nuptial pad. And uh, in female, you don't have that kind of a calloused uh, separate pad, right? I mean, if they do have it, it's actually inconspicuous. It does not have a different color. In males, it comes in a much more darker color, right? Now, what is the purpose of this pad? Anyone wants to make a guess? Why is it only in males? Think about that. Is it for mating purposes? 100% correct. That's exactly the purpose, right? The, the purpose is actually this, right? <laughs> um, this is a female and this is a male, right? Again, the male is much smaller than the female, right? So the female, if she does not like to mate with that boy, she can easily kick him off. And I have seen this happening, right? The male trying to get hold onto the female and she kicks him off, literally kicking with her hind limbs, right? And, and, and that kick is quite powerful. You can see sometimes the male getting like, whoop, right? And then in order to prevent that, he needs to make a firmer grasp on the female, right? And you can see that happening over here. Well, that's not enough either. Like, look how firmly they have to grasp the female, right? This is actually the male's front limbs. Those additional nuptial pads, thumb pads, kind of generates a friction force that firmly holds on to the female's body uh, during the during this amplexus period. It's actually this. They, so they they do undergo this courting behavior, and they could actually remain in that courtship for several hours. Right, but fertilization is external. Like what happens is the male will hold on to the female until she releases her eggs, and then he will lay her uh, lay his sperms on the top, and then they both part their ways. Right. Um, so this is a really interesting courtship behavior that I can never, um, I never get uh, tired of uh, watching them in the real life, right? So again, like I'm showing you like how large in certain males that thumb pad becomes, right? Um, over here, right? How large the thumb pad can become compared to the rest of the, um, rest of the finger, right? And in a female, like you can, you have, you don't see that at all, right? Generally the limb can be larger in female, right? But 
the thumb pad is absent or extremely small if they have it, right? Mostly it's absent. Like look at the, the body size difference. The male is about a centimeter smaller than the female, right? Okay, and then um, that's actually, that size difference is extremely um, pronounced when it comes to toads, right? The male is extremely smaller, right? Look, he can barely wrap his hands around the female for, uh, for courtship, right? For the copulation, right? Um, not for the copulation, I would rather say courtship, right? Um, so these thumb pads are extremely important for them to make sure that happens, right? So the tympanum size, again, can be used very successfully if you want to separate between a uh, uh, male and female of any bullfrog, North American bullfrog, African bullfrog, that's a very cool characteristic, right? That you can use, right? Clearly, females has a very smaller eardrum uh, or a tympanum and males has much larger uh, one, right? It's unmistakably um, larger. Um, but that cannot be applied for any other amphibian. It can be applied for like a very handful of species of frogs, particularly frogs that are relatively larger in body size, right? It cannot be applied for uh, medium sized or small sized ones, like a peeper, like you cannot apply that for them. All right, so going to the internal anatomy of frogs, right? I will quickly go over, you know, the arrangement of the body organs. So the external nares, right? Or the uh, nostrils opens up to internal nostrils, right? And then uh, they actually have this really cool teeth pads, bones with teeth on the roof of the frog. Like what we are looking at over here is we put a frog on its back on its dorsal side, right? And we are looking at the frog from its ventral side. We cut it up and um, you flap, sort of flap out the lower jaw. The lower jaw is over here and you're looking, staring into the roof of the upper jaw, right? So on the roof of the upper jaw, you see these two sets of bones that actually have teeth on them. They are called vomerine teeth. What is the purpose of those having those bones with teeth? Anyone want to make a guess? To grab on. Go ahead. <laughs> to grab on to prey. That's actually correct. It is to prevent the prey from escaping, right? It does not physically create any digestion. It's not, it does not break down the food. It hold on to the prey, right? Um, unlike us, right? Other vertebrates with teeth cannot physically digest, right? Um, like they cannot do breaking or maceration or chewing or anything like that. Now, um, and then the oral cavity leads to this esophagus opening, right? It's actually an opening. And then the esophagus um, runs sort of over here. And then, the esophagus connects to the stomach. I don't see the stomach over here because there are lots of other organs on the top. Um, if I go anywhere else, do I see another picture? Nope. Oh, here, there we go, right? This is actually the stomach, right? The esophagus connects to the stomach and then the stomach connects to um, the small intestine, right? and the small intestine connects to the large intestine, right? I cannot see the large intestine over here, but I can clearly see the small intestine, right? Um, and so between the space, between, between the stomach and the small intestine, you actually see this membrane structure, which is actually the pancreas, right? Other structures associated with the digestive system includes this huge organ that comes up with multiple lobes, right? This, that is the liver. Well, pop-up question for you guys. What is the largest organ of the human body? The skin. Correct. What is the second largest organ of the human body? Is it the liver? Correct. The Correct. Good. Very good. And then you see these kind of really flimsy um, shapeless structures all over the body cavity. Those are fat bodies. They're actually, it's kind of unfortunate in this photograph. 
they look like drab gray in color, but in a real dissection, they are more yellower in color. In fact, sometimes bright yellow in color, right? Um, well, that's actually the basic parts of the body that I wanted to show. And uh, let's go back to the image that we were looking at earlier here. Um, and the other stuff is actually the heart. You can see this the dark colored part over here is actually the left atrium. Another dark colored part is the atrium. So two atria, right? And the third chamber is the ventricle, right? Which is actually very muscular, right? And in fact, if you were touching this, you can feel how um, heavy the ventricle is, how muscular the ventricle is compared to the atria, right? Um, and then, of course, on the top, this particular, this large blood vessel, right, that you see is actually the, the systemic arch. There are two systemic arch, left and right systemic arch. The right systemic arch is actually, it's not very clear over here. It's going this way. Left one is going that way. That's very conspicuously large blood vessels leaving the heart and they are systemic arches. So they distribute blood from the heart to the rest of the body. Mm. And then this particular opening that actually uh, leads to the, uh, the part of the inner ear is actually the Eustachian tube opening, right? It's a canal, it's a tube that connects the oral cavity with the inner ear, right? Um, all righty. And then how the front tongue work, watch the video, it's kind of interesting. Your tongue, my tongue, or in mammalian system, the tongue is attached from its back end to the oral cavity, right? Your front end is free. That's why actually you can actually put your tongue out. That's how you put your tongue out by actually, you know, by uh, using the muscles in your tongue, you actually put the front end of the tongue out. In the frog is the opposite. The tongue is attached from the front end to the, um, to the bottom of the mouth. So in order to put their tongue out, which they need to do when they are catching prey, they flap it out, right? They flap their tongue out like you see in this picture, right? And the video actually shows a good image of that. And here you can clearly see, right? This is the front end of the tongue. And this is the, uh, so this is, the, sorry, this is the front end of the tongue. This is the back end of the tongue. So they put the back end out, right? Because the front end is fused, right? To the oral cavity, to us the, to the floor of the oral cavity or the buccal cavity. Um, so now let's quickly label this with me, right? Um, they actually have uh, teeth on the margin. Let me, let me quickly go over here, right? Ah, no, no, no. Right. So um, there are teeth on the margin, right, of the jaw. It's, and, and that Jaw, the bone of the, the name of that particular bone of the upper jaw is called maxillae, right? So the teeth are actually called maxillary teeth. You cannot see maxillary teeth in the photograph, right? Maybe, maybe the, this very pinkish lining you see is actually maxillary teeth. But if it is, you know, in the real life, you can see them. They are not microscopic. They can, you can clearly see them, but not visible in the photograph. Um, Right, and you can certainly feel them if you rub your finger around the mouth, around their mouth, and that teeth is actually called maxillary teeth. Now, talk with now. Tell me, I'm asking the question. Those holes that are on the roof of the mouth are called what? That connects with the sinus. What are those? What are those holes? What's the name? Nostrils. Sorry. They called nostrils. Um. Internal or external? Internal. Internal. I can make sure you mention that, okay? Because they have external and internal. And then these things that actually bones on the roof of the mouth, which teeth on them. What are those? The vomerine teeth. Correct. Vomerine teeth or vomerine teeth. And these openings in the back of the mouth that also leads to the sinuses and the inner ear that helps with the auditory function? Um, tube opening. Ah, uh, what tube opening? You have to have the name. Um, Starts with the E. Yeah. 
I think you know what you're saying, but you cannot pronounce the. Uh, yeah, it's like you estrian. You stakian. You stakian. Okay. Right. Um. Right. You have the stakian tube too, right? I mean. So um. And also, it's it's another way to study is actually relate to where that particular thing is in your body, right? Um, so, um, if I insert the probe all the way, right, from the from the back of the mouth, right, where would you where would my probe will end up with? What organ? Esophagus. Very good. Correct. And this is a really interesting thing, right? Can you see this slit right over here, right? What do you call that structure that contains the slit? The pharynx? Mm, no, it's actually, you have a structure of something very similar too, right? It's a muscular, like that's why it's actually kind of a, you know, raised up, right? And, um, it, and that leads to the lung for the respiratory structures, right? And you have something very similar too, right? The point of that muscular structure is to, you know, sort of prevent stuff going the wrong way. Uh, so is, in us, is it a uvula? And is in the frog, is it an epiglottis? So that's actually a close, right? Um, in us, it is epiglottis, okay? We have a flap on the top of the glottis. So we call that epiglottis, right? And in frogs, it is just glottis, right? They don't have a structure covering the slit. It's, it's just open, right? What we have is we have a flap covering that particular structure. That's why in our case, we call it epiglottis. In these guys, it's just glottis. Um, the muscles, again, there are lots of muscles in a frog, but this is actually kind of all the muscles that you find in the underside of the, uh, the frog. Here, um, I'm actually labeling the muscles that I want you to know, though I expect you to know, right? Um, any other muscle that I haven't labeled, I don't expect you to know them, right? So let's go part by part over here and try to understand these muscles. Uh, remembering them is quite easy, but always know, know one thing before you tell me what muscle that is, right? Um, First thing, where am I looking at? Am I looking at the dorsal view? Where you are looking at the backside of the frog? Am I looking at its ventral view? Where you are looking at its abdomen, right? Or, or the belly side, right? That's number one. Two, where am I looking at in the frog, right? Is it in the torso, right? Or am I looking at the legs? If I'm looking at the legs, am I looking at the upper portion of the limb? Am I looking at the lower portion of the limb? Upper portion of the limb is called the thigh, right? Lower portion of the limb actually uh, has two parts, right? The, so this is the thigh, right? And this is called the shank, S-H-A-N-K, shank, right? Where you have the calf muscle, right? And this part, or rather this part is called the foot. Foot, shank, high, right? So know where you're looking at. So when you, so when you study, know where these muscles are found between the torso, thigh, shank, and the foot. And two, what side am I looking at? Dorsal or ventral, right? Um, so on the dorsal side, right? Um, this is very easy to remember. You are looking at the chest. Okay, you are looking at the chest. What do you call the chest muscles that you work out? Pectorals. Pectorals. You, in my diagram, I call them pectoralis major. Just go by pectoralis, right? Now, I wanted to give you one warning. This is something that has been angering me a lot, right? Um, pectoralis spreads over here, and some of them actually moves like downwards, but we do not expect you to know the downward one, right? Just know the ones you find over here. So that's why we just call them pectoralis, right? If you just call them pectoralis, that's fine. Pectoralis major is the correct word. Anyway, moving forward. Abs, right? The so-called six pack, right? In fact, like let's, let's test your uh, anatomical knowledge. How many pairs of abdominal muscles do we have? Is it actually six? 
I don't think so. I think we have more than six. I think those are just the most obvious ones. Correct. Correct. Right. Because there are there should be like you know the vertebrate body plan has eight of them, right? But the development of all the eight is not uh, very clear in the um, mammalian side. But in frogs, they actually have uh, four sets, so they have actually an eight pack, not a six pack, right? Um, and so this is the rect rectus abdominalis. This is the abs of the frog. And then um, on the side, right? So the side muscles are visible both dorsally and ventrally, but external obliques or oblique muscles are much more prominent from the dorsal view, but you can also see them from the, uh, from the ventral view as well, right? That is actually, these are obliques, right? External obliques, these are external obliques. Now, I do not expect you to know these muscles, do not. That's why I have blacked them out. Now let's move to the limb, the thigh, right? Um, in the thigh, um, this large muscle that kind of is, you know, oriented towards the, the outside of the frog or the lateral side, right, is actually tricep. It's large, so it's actually tricep. There is a bicep, but I'm not expecting you to know that, right? This is the tricep, right? Now tricep uh, is visible from the ventral view as well as from the dorsal view. Right. And then um, the next muscle, next large muscle is actually sartorius. That sartorius muscle is not visible from the dorsal view, only visible from the ventral view. Okay. And the next muscle that you see over here, which looks like a wedge, but it's not wedge shaped, the rest of the muscle is sort of hidden. Right? So this one muscle that you find after sartorius, again visible from the ventral side, is actually adductor magnus, right? Um, and then you have like then on then you move towards the sort of the inner side of the muscle. We were looking at the outer side and then to the, the middle side, and now you're looking at the outer side of the muscle, right? So where are the muscle actually faces the other leg, right? Instead of the outer side, right? You have gracilis. Two, two, two of them are there. One is large, we call it gracilis major. One is small, you call it gracilis minor. Right? Coming back over here, you can clearly see gra gracilis uh, minor, right? Because it's actually much more thinner um, outer muscle. Can't see gracilis major though, right? From the dorsal side. Um, other muscles you can find includes um, this one. Now this one is actually quite literally membranous because it's a very thin film of muscles, right? That uh, that spreads over here. That is called semi-membranous muscle, right? Now um, let's move on to the that's the thigh. That's all about the thigh, right? Now let's move on to the shank, right? Only two muscles that you need to know: gastrocnemus, right? Now, gastrocnemus is actually gastro means like stomach like, right? The muscle looks like stomach and it's the largest muscle that you can see, right? Um, if you properly extend the shank, you can see it from the ventral side as well, right? That is gastrocnemus. This muscle you can see right over here from the dorsal valve, um, it's tibius anticus, right? Um, this muscle is tibius anticus. Now, this muscle you can see from the uh, ventral side is not the same as tibius anticus, okay? Keep, remember that, but I don't want you to know what that is, right? Um, uh, actually, these are the old muscles that I expect you to know. Now, what I want you to do is wh when you continue on studying, fill in the blanks yourself. Just to help out, I have, I have included all the muscles that you need to know over here. Right, and the study diagram, and then go back and try to label them yourself. I have provided the description that correctly and accurately describes um, the muscle shape and also um, where it is located, what shape it is, right? Whether it's a thin strap like or whether it's actually much larger. So you can actually um, study all of that yourself. Um, I know the muscle names are weird. Remember that. When you're taking the practical, you can have uh, your lab notebook with you, so you don't have to worry about correctly pronouncing them or how to correctly write them. You can just turn the pages and look it up. Um, right, 
and we have gone through this already. Um, so this one is actually sort of a diagrammatic uh, labeling. This sort of has everything, right? Um, in the internal anatomy, right? And, and then the, the label diagrams actually show uh, most of the other stuff. So when you are labeling, um, that was something over here, right? When you label them yourself, you know, you can also, you know, look at the dissected one, right? And like these ones, dissected ones, and then of course, go for this diagrammatic one over here as well, right? And when you understand that from there, you can actually try to name this organ. Let's do a couple over here actually, right? This brightly yellow colored stuff that is all over the abdominal cavity. What, what are those guys? What do you call them? That stores fat. Adipose tissue. Adipose tissue, excellent. Good use of the terminology. Fat bodies is perfectly fine, but adipose tissue, thumbs up. Um, and can you see what these are? These are actually eggs, right? They, they actually are black and white in color. So um, so these cells, right? Um, those eggs, right? That actually, you know, um, that you contain in female leg, female reproductive system, produced by female reproductive system. What do you call them before fertilization? Egg is a term that is correctly used when it is fertilized or when it is laid outside. What do you call them? Female reproductive cells? Starts with the letter O. Ovaries. Ovary is the organ that produces female reproductive cells. Ovum. Correct. Single, singular, ovum, plural, ova. Right? O V A, O V U M, ovum, O V A, ova. Um, they are eggs, but like learn the correct term. Um, and these tubes, right, that actually hold female reproductive cells after being produced. What are those called? Ovaries produce them, and these are tubes. What do you call those? Is it it... Oh. Sorry? No, go ahead. I I was said... gonna... Oh, go ahead, you go first. <laughs> I, I was gonna say fallopian tubes, but I don't know if that's right. Um, That's actually good. The, the term fallopian, we use it for the, male, uh, the, the human system. So what would be the vertebrate equivalent? Overduct. Correct. Excellent. Right. And then um, male reproductive system. Well, this bean-shaped thing, right, are not kidneys. Okay. Those are actually testes, right? So remember, in mammals, testes are located in the um, testicles, located in the scrotum sac, right? Located externally, in fact. Right, but other vertebrates, it's internal. Okay, so that is actually the testes. Okay, um, and actual kidneys are sort of stuck to the underside of the body wall. Like if you, you have to remove all of these organs away to see that. Right. Um, well, I will actually let you label this on your own. It's pretty easy. To do, to do, to do, to do, to do, to do. Um, oh, this is actually a cool one to mention, right? So this one, this is actually very like a bulb-like thing that actually holds bile. What is that? That's located underneath the liver, by the way. What is that? Very good. That's actually the gallbladder. Very good. Excellent. Um, anything cool that I might want to point out here that is harder? Anyone want to make a guess? This very uh, filamentous, not filamentous, very strap-like, very flimsy tissue that is located in between stomach and the intestine. What is that? Pancreas. Pancreas, very good. It's actually, we don't have to go through all of them. Aha, this is a good one. This is sort of a um, sac-like structure, very membranous, right? Located, found when you lift off the liver, that is what? 
the lung that is the lung that's correct there are two you know one pair of lung you know that one here you only see uh one of them um and again right on top of the liver you actually find this this is the uh, the ventricle of the heart right it, here we say three chambered organ of the that pumps blood so you can see just the heart not the ventricle but if you mention what chamber this specifically is that is located at the bottom is actually the ventricle now something that is not clear over here that very well is um the ventricle the atria or the auricles are actually right on the top they are extremely small compared to the size of the ventricle right um okay this is a good one now this is testes if you remember right um and this particular thing right that is part of the lymphatic system that is responsible for sort of recycling red blood cells is what you and i have it too lymph node lymph nodes will be never that large but lymph nodes are part of the lymphatic system and lymph nodes are usually found in aggregations um towards the not necessarily not necessarily in the body cavity but more towards the um the body wall right um, um again not necessarily right but quite close what kind of an organ lymph nodes are not one thing it's all over the body right this is just one thing that uh, is go ahead kidneys kidneys are not part of the lymphatic system right it kidneys do not recycle your red blood cells it filters everything but the red blood cell right so what is that when i say recycles let me explain what i mean by that it breaks down um used red blood cells right and um and also stores some of your white blood cells i will mention that right um uh, uh and, and and temporarily stores some of your white blood cells as well yeah yeah so before liver uh, you know takes up the um taking up the ions right you know this particular organ requires to process red blood cells start with the letter s the spleen correct right and now this one is actually this particular organ it goes from starts from here and sort of sp spreads all the way like down you know into um the body cavity right which is actually has ex excretory functions what is that kidney yeah that is exactly true right now let me clarify this says hint the frogs organs are in the same place as ours yeah generally they are but remember even for you right when you undergo a kidney surgery right the surgeon does not open up you from the front right open you know like it actually happens from the back end from the side right um the reason is in in all vertebrates the kidneys are actually more located towards the you know towards the um the dorsal surface of our body wall right so that's actually what we mentioned over there but our ones are kidney shaped these guys they are actually a uh, bean shaped they are not bean shaped they are actually more longer uh, elongated structures um that you find in 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 uh, amphibians there is an evolutionary reason for that but i'm not going to go into that detail and of course the last one this pouch that is responsible for holding um the waste generated by the kidney is what and it actually can absorb some of the water while it is uh, um kept in that particular structure but you and i have the same organ we cannot absorb water did you say the one that's responsible for holding waste is that it yeah holding nitrogenous waste i will clarify that is it the bladder correct um better yet call it urinary bladder okay oh. um 
The reason for that is actually not, not directly related to amphibians. There's a swim bladder and a urinary bladder that you find in fish. That's why we actually um, call them uh, two separate names. Um, yeah. Uh, now let's move on to the skeleton. Again here, you know, like what you're doing is these are the displays. What you have to do is take a look at um, these skeletons, right? So I have marked with arrows, purple, humerus, green, ulna and radius, right? And, um, and then I have uh, the femur marked in um, blue, right? So all the photos have those arrows marked, you know, uh, always humerus, purple, ulna radius part in green, femur in blue, right? And for the comparison, I have labeled diagrams on the side, right? How bats look like, kind of compared to humans. See how we differ, right? We have the same structure, but look how elongated right, the, the hand part is, right? In the bats, right? This um, carpals, metacarpals, you know, what happens to those uh, fingers, right? Fingers are extremely elongated, right? In the bats, right? Compared to us. And look how uh, small the ulna is, right? Compared to us. Radius has relatively the same comparable lens, but ulna has become extremely small, right? You know, so compare, um, and try to be able to label yourself the skeletals, skeletal system in the limb, right? And then try to understand how it has modified for these animals' lifestyle, right? The why fingers are like that? Well, because it has to accommodate the flight membrane to make the wing, right, in the bat. Then you are looking at the cat skeleton. Again, the same level of labeling, right? Um, see what, what kind of differences you see in the cat compared to other vertebrates, right? Clearly, you can see the foot has become longer and the foot is not totally landing on the substrate. It's actually sort of, um, sort of has an upright uh, body pose, right? Only the last phalanges, right, are touching the ground. Right, um, and others are not. They are lifted off the ground, right? And the, again, the foot part is quite long, right? Um, and there are lots, lot more. You know, like anatomically, the position, the lie position of the bones are not straight up. They are more angled, right? Um, and the ulna radius both are present, right? Um, femur is much larger, present, and the the length of the limb is elongated by lengthening of the foot largely, right? So in this one, in the in this skeleton, this entire part is actually the foot. Rather than flat on the ground, it's upright. Let's look at the bird. Extreme level of modification, right? There are many bones that actually have, have lost, right? They have completely disappeared, right? In birds. Um, And particularly the hand part, right? Lots of bones in the hand part, right? Has, you know, ha have become lost, right? Um, and if you're looking at an amphibian, you're looking at a salamander, it's called hellbender, right? Um, yeah, my arrows are all over the place. Um, hind limbs, so this is actually the femur, right? Um, in the front limb, right? This is actually the humerus. Right, um, and here you actually have the the diagram, right? So in salamander, they actually both have ulna and radius separately, but um, in frogs, ulna and radius can be fused together to make radio ulna, right? In in, in many frogs, that can be fused, right? Um, and the number of digits you don't see five; you only see four, right? So in the frog skeleton, actually, again, we, we can see um, the humerus has, the, the femur has become much longer, right? Because that is an adaptation for jumping, right? Compared to uh, humerus, femur has become much longer. That is to help them jump, right? And another character that you cannot exactly see in this one is actually the ulna and radius in, in this diagram has become fused. That is actually when they land, they land they, they first land on their front limbs. So that kind of fusion helps them to absorb shock, right? So, so the bones don't break. 
and then actually you follow with this uh, dichotomous scheme, right? Um, well, by now you should be very comfortable with doing the dichotomous scheme yourself. You said that so yourself. That's it, guys. So any questions before I show you and tell you a thing or two about um, the exam, the, the practical? Any questions? Uh, what, will, what will we need to label for night for um, the basal animals? Labeling? None. It's simply what you do is you go through the key, right? This is the key. And these are the animals that you go through. So there won't be anything to label structure-wise on the exam? No, 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 no. Nothing other than whatever I labeled in the, remember the, um, the background PowerPoint that I have had? That had some things that I have labeled, but other than that, um, like these ones, do I expect you to be able to label any of these? Um, nope, nope, just actually knowing what these are. Anything else? All right, good. So let's, let me show you where this particular da, 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 exam is going to be. All right, are we, give me a nod. Are we all looking at my uh, Blackboard page? Okay, so you navigate to your Blackboard over here, right? And then you go to course contents over here and um, your practical will be right inside the course content on the top. There are two parts. This one, you will not see this yet, okay? Um, you will see like this. You don't see that at all, right? It will show up um, on your day of the exam and, uh, and about 15 minutes before the lab time, right? And both of them will show up. And this is the actual practical. The second link is the actual practical. The first link is the PowerPoint presentation, which has the photograph. What I'm going to do is other than the PowerPoint itself, I'm also going to upload a, a PDF of the same PowerPoint. The, when you, the PDF is better way to go through because the things doesn't move around, right? In a PowerPoint, things can move around in some cases, particularly if you have a Mac computer as opposed to a, um, um, a Windows computer. So I'm also going to upload the same PowerPoint presentation as a PDF just to make the life easier. So download both, right? And then read the question, look at the corresponding question number or the slide number in the uh, PowerPoint or the PDF, right? So keep them juxtaposed on your screen side by side or keep flipping your um, windows, whatever you like and go for it. Like I mentioned last time, um, it's all multiple choice questions, except for the two bonus where you have to type in the answer. Bonus are completely optional. You can opt out of it, but I encourage not to opt out. Um, uh, multiple choice questions are mandatory, right? You have to complete all of them. Um, you have to complete the exam in one seating. You cannot go halfway, exit the exam and come back. You should not do that, right? You have to complete all of them at one seating. Start about 15 minutes earlier and exam closes 15 minutes after. You will, we will provide you two attempts, right? Like I mentioned, it's open book. Um, we are not doing any policing. We are not asking you to keep your video uh, camera on. No, take it on your own privacy. There is no Zoom meeting um, to take the exam through. Um, completely up to you. Uh, like it's completely you do it your own time, not your own time, uh, on your own, but during the lab time frame. Um, you are welcome to keep your, um, it's open book, so you, we are not policing what you are using, but my advice, my strong recommendation is use just your lab notebook. That contains everything you need because everything from my PowerPoint presentations that are important, everything from the lab exercises, um, and everything we expect you to know um, for the in preparation for the uh, practical should be by now on your lab practical, uh, in your lab notebook, okay? Should be on your lab notebook. So keep that. That's the only thing you need with you. Um, so we are not using the lockdown browser because some of you might keep your lab notebook electronically. So that you, you, there's no lockdown browser. Uh, 
what is the other things that I can tell you? And the other one is a lab notebook, right? Um, once you finish your uh, practical, you will have still more time to work on your lab notebook. And after all of that is over, you submit it through Blackboard. Um, where is that? You go to this particular folder and it is this one, Lab Notebook Zoology, right? Upload that as a single file, right? Those who maintain a physical handwritten notebook, take photograph or scan every page, merge all of them as a single file, um, as a, a single PDF file or copy and paste all of those um, onto OneNote or copy and paste all of them onto a Word document or onto a PowerPoint. I don't care how you do that, right? Um, and make sure it's a one document, right? And then hit upload. That's it. Make and, and it's a, it's going to be a heavy file because that's going to be lots of photograph. Make wait until it completes the upload, and then you're, you're all set. And tonight, make sure you upload um, your um, preliminary family information right over here, right? Only one of you need to upload that for your entire group. And when you upload, make sure to include all names of your group, right? In the document you're submitting. Guys, so we actually are done. And we are done We're fairly early today. Um, we do have a lab for this week, don't we? Um, like this particular week? Yeah. Yeah, that's what we I just finished. Uh, what about a homework sheet? Oh yeah, I will go through that. Oh, that's what you meant, Emily? Yeah, that, that's what I meant. I'm, oh, I meant the yeah, yeah, yeah. Sheet. I was going to go through it. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to go through it. But um, no, I, 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 yeah, misunderstood what you said. Um, anything regarding what I explained today? Anything regarding before I go over the homework? Anything regarding practical or what is due tonight? Um, due tonight is just the homework sheet from last lab. And the, 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 the preliminary family information regarding your poster. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's actually, that's all. That's, that's all that's due. That's, come on. Um, here, that one. Yep. All right, let's go over the homework real quick. Um, so the first job is over here. You are looking at um, complete the table with the functions of the systems of organs of the frog. Include two to three organs for both males and females and compare each organ um, to those of humans. Be specific and be specific as possible. So the first function is integumentary, meaning the, the thing around you, right? Um, the, the skin, right? So the function of the integument is what? This is where you need to start uh, communicating. Respiration. Um, the function um, is, yeah, respiration is correct. And for us, what is the function? Protection. Yeah, protection, right? So in the integument, you have to mention um, outer prote like protection or physical protection. And for amphibian, it is respiration, right? Um, so do not forget to mention the human uh, relevance, right? So that's why the protection comes. In amphibians, there is a protective function. Don't forget that because, you know, the fact that they secrete um, these anti-microbial compounds is protective. Um, and list two, three organs, um, right? So uh, what kind of organs, integumentary organs or, uh, or parts in, in the integument that actually provides protection? Right, integumentary is actually the, the, the function, right? Protection, right? What, what is, what's the organ that provides the primary integumentary uh, protective function? Epidermis? 
Yeah. Epid better say skin, right? Because epidermis is part of the skin. Skin, right? And then uh, what other skin structures do we have um, in the amphibian, right? That actually, um, again, in the amphibian, that actually have protective functions, right? These could be parts embedded in the skin. These could be parts derived from the skin. Poison gland. Correct. And very good. Another gland that might be protective. Um, their mucus gland. That's correct. And you can actually leave your mics open now because you know you need to um, communicate. That's correct. Um, yeah, that's actually pretty pretty good. Comparison of the. Uh, the third column, comparison of each organ to the humans, right? Um, in terms of function, in terms of location and size, right? How do you compare? Location is the same, right? Right, And the function is also the same, right? And you can mention rather than saying the same, like same how. It's a barrier, um, like a physical defense, right? And it's kind of located as the outer surfaces, right? And for both of us, it's the largest organ in our body. Um, yeah, and of course, uh, the the poison glands and uh, skin, uh, sorry, poison glands and mucus glands, you can mention, those are only limited to the frog. Humans have glands in their skin, right? But they are not poison glands or mucus glands, right? Um, yeah, that's actually basically it. Movements, uh, sorry, muscular, right? The function of uh, the muscular system is what? Movement. Movement, helping movement, supporting movement, uh, uh, coordinating movements, pr pr producing movements, right? And what kind of organs, right, actually have muscles in the frog? So you can list, remember all of those muscles I, I taught you? I went over, you can list any of them. You don't have to list all of them. I'm only list, asking you to list, you know, no more than three, right? Um, so you can list any of those muscles, right? Abdominal muscles, right? The, the lateral muscles, the pec muscles, right? Um, the leg muscles, you can list any of them, right? Um, and then comparing to the human, right? Interestingly, guys, um, the name as well as the anatomical, precise anatomical location of them is the same, right? The function is also the name. It's actually either to abduct or to uh, extend, right? A particular part of the body, right? It's, it's a, even the movements are quite similar, right? The foot movements, the shank movements, the ankle joint based movements, the, the, the groin based movements, whatever that frog do, we can do it a little better, right? Um, that's actually so, so that the, the function part is interestingly the same. Circulatory, right? What is the function of the circulatory system in general? Carry oxygen and nutrients to everywhere in the body. Perfect. So it actually, the question is what it carries. You said oxygen, correct. Uh, you can say carbon dioxide, that would be also correct. So you can say, you know, uh, circulating gases, that is required for cellular respiration, right? Yes, circulating nutrients. Another thing it circulates is actually what? Hormones circulates um, um, nitrogenous wastes from the rest of the body to the kidneys, right? And what are the organs of the circulatory system? Again, no more than three. The heart. Correct. What else? Always circular system has tubes and hearts. Right. If it is a closed circulatory system, so what? What's the other thing you can mention? Blood vessels. Blood vessels. That's not bad. Can you name a third one? A very specific blood vessel that I showed you in the dissection. Aorta. Yeah. I actually for the frog there are two aortic arches: the right and left systemic aortic arch. Right. So, yeah, that actually be, be very careful when you mention the name, right? Because we have different names in different animal systems. Comparison of the function, it's very similar to the humans, right? Um, 
And then respiratory, tell me, um, the function of the res respiratory system is what? Oxygen exchange. Yeah, and, and again, always think comprehensively. Oxygen exchange is not incorrect, right? It's actually rather gaseous exchange because that involves getting rid of carbon dioxide and taking up oxygen, right? Um, organs, now this is the one that students usually make, you know, don't do very well. They actually just mention lungs and skin, right? Remember, when it comes to the frog, you are listing all the organs. So the mouth, the nostril, uh, no, no, nostrils don't play a role, uh, mouth, pharynx, right, trachea, right, the bronchi, like, I mean, all the organs, you know, like from, you know, the point they take up water, right, or air from the mouth, right, all the way until the air gets to the lung, right, all of those organs should be listed over there, right. Um, now, respiratory system differs quite a lot between us and frogs, right, we don't use our skin for respiration anymore, um, but lungs we do, right, but the lungs are quite different, right? Who do you think have the greater lung surface, us or frogs? Who has the greatest lung surface? Um, I wanna say us, mainly because we're larger than frogs. Yep, and then also we have something called alveoli in our lung, which increases the surface area, right? Yes, why we have such larger, surface areas, because we are larger, we are bigger animals, we need more oxygen uptake. So that's actually why. Um, and yeah, that's actually, that, that should be good enough. And then reproductive, right? Reproduction, well, the function is to propagate your own kind, right? And uh, what we have in the frog in terms of reproductive system, Go on listing. What kind of organs did we cover so far? Ovaries, oviduct. Um, did we go over uterus as well? Yeah, we did. Yeah. Um, uterus, we didn't. So we don't have to list that one. Um, in males, don't forget that, right? Testes, right? And do not forget where, they, where all of these reproductive cells exit. What is that? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, all the reproductive cells exit the the frog body through what exactly? Cloaca. Correct, cloaca, right? Um, and what do we frogs have? The humans do not. Out of all of those, cloaca. Correct, correct, right? Um. And also do not forget what happens to the oviduct and where the fallopian tubes in humans evolve, right? So what we have is actually vestigial oviducts, right? I mean, you should actually research on that. Um, since we actually we have this fallopian tubes that, uh, that, that uh, is produced secondarily. Excretory system, right? What do you see in terms of excretory systems? There are only two organs that I cover um, for the frog. Those are, don't be shy. Urinary bladder. Correct, and one more. So where does you urinary bladder get the excreta from? The cloaca again? Uh, no, clo so mm, cloaca is actually where the urinary bladder empties to. So the urinary bladder should collect urine, right, from somewhere else. Uh, kidneys. Kidneys, correct, correct, correct. So comparison, do we have a urinary bladder and kidneys? Yes, but is the kidney anatomy the same? No, right? Um, so you can mention that there are differences in the kidney anatomy, particularly um, the organization of nephrons in the kidney in humans are quite different from uh, amphibians, right? Because in uh, us, we have a much more elaborative mechanisms to absorb water. We have those very long uh, Henle loops, right? In our nephrons, you don't have that kind of 
very deep henle loops or very long nephrons um, in amphibian kidneys, right? So skeleton, um, what is the function of the skeleton, guys? That's an interesting one. Provides structure and framework. Yep, it provides a framework or maintains the body shape, provides a st proper structure to the body. And the one thing that students always forget is skeleton provides protection. Protection is not a bad one. In certain times it does, but our skeleton is internal and it does protect the brain. It does protect the spinal cord. That's a great answer, right? So there is a protective function in so for certain organs, not for the entire body. It also protects your lungs. And heart, the rib cage, is a protector for your most of the thoracic organs, right? And there are certain skeletal elements that actually sort of keep some blood vessels in place. So yes, that's actually an excellent answer. Another function that student forgets is what? Pro. Yeah, Randolph, you want to mention something? I was gonna say about the bone marrow because it, it something about it has the nutrients and nourishes it and stuff like that. That's not a bad one at all. Skeletal system is a storage device for minerals, for calcium, right? And it actually provides space for um for the for 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 production of red blood cells, right? So yes, that's actually um a, a really good answer. Another one, much more obvious one, is it provides a surface for muscle attachment. It helps coordinate movements with the muscular system, right? So there are lots of things that I want you to know with regard to skeletal system, right? Organs, ah, we covered several bones. Can someone throw, <laughs> pun intended, a bone at me? Femur. Correct, one more. The radial ulna. Radia, radius and ulna, correct. That's two, that's three bones. The biggest bone on your leg, what is that? Because like only born on your thigh. Let me uh, give you a hint. The femur. The femur, yeah. The two bones on your shank. Yeah, there are two bones on your shank. I did not mention the names, but I'm asking you. Tibia is the largest bone. Fibula, yeah, correct. Fibula is the smaller bone, right? Um, and then phalanges, those are bones that's in the hand, right? Um, carpals, metacarpals that actually, I think we mentioned a couple of those in uh, some of our early lectures, right? Yeah, you can main any three bones and I'll take it as an answer. Ribs, that's a bone. Cranium, I, I mentioned that, that's a bone, right? Um, vertebrae, that's a bone. I, you can mention any of those. Um, so we have, interestingly enough, we and um, frogs share almost all the bone, the basic bone structure, have the same layout of the skeleton, have same pentadactyly pattern. You can mention that, the same pentadactyl pattern. The girdle structure is the same, but um, the differences is fusion of the bones. There are certain bones that fused in the amphibian, like radio ulna, that's not fused in us, right? This part, in us, ulna radius are separate in us. In many amphibians, it's actually fused into radio ulna, particularly amphibians that jump, that leap. Those two bones are fused, right? Um, and the, in the girdle too, in the pelvic girdle, there are more bone fusion in the frog, right? But not in humans, right? Um, and also the frogs actually have a longer tail-like part in the skeletal system, we don't have that kind of a thing, right? Um, so those are the differences you find, right? And um, yeah, there are a lot more similarities. They have separate digits connected by webbing. You can mention that as a, as a distinction, right? Um, but we don't have the webbing thing. Our, our webs are like very, very minimal, right? And, and the webbings do not have a skeletal support, right? It's a skin, uh, not, not actually a skeletal support. Um, yeah, the adaptation, the difference I see is actually our body, our skeletal system has developed to support 
bipedal movements, right? Uh, but amphibians, at least the frog, the example frog you are looking at um, is for jumping movements, right? So those are that's the differences you see are related to the primary mode of locomotion. And of course, all frogs can swim, right? Um, but uh, the primary mode of uh, adaptation is for terrestrial based locomotion, right? The kicking movement that you see in frogs when they swim, that is a sort of a secondary um, function of, the, of their uh, muscular skeletal system. It's not a primary function. Um, the same movement happens on the land to a better degree. Um, okay, let's move further down. We have one, a couple of more other activities to cover. Um, so this one, describe the relative length of the humerus and the femur for three of the vertebrates on display, right? Then those vertebrates on display, the one that I covered, frog, alligator, bat, cat, bird. Um, and, and, and pick, um, describe the relative lengths of the, pick three of them because there are three things you have to fill, right? And what you should not do is actually do not pick, um, two flying vertebrates, right? You know, pick three different ones, like the alligator, frog, and the bat, or the alligator, frog, and the bird, or cat, frog, and the bird, right? Like that, make sure you pick three distinct category uh, groups for the three columns over here. And um, and how they affect different differences in locomotion between those species. Explain how they locomote, well, are they walking? Are they hopping? Are they jumping? Are they leaping? Are they running? Are they swimming? Can they fly, right? And also explain how, right? For example, if it is walking, what kind of uh, limb structure is adapted for that? And I will play an example. And, and then how the length of the humerus affect their locomotion? Have, they, have the humerus become shorter? Have the humerus become longer? Has the humerus become lighter? Has the humerus become flatter, right? Like that. Um, and how length of the femur affect their locomotion? Same thing. Has it become more larger, heavier, rounder, longer, or shorter? How one could tell the movements of a skeleton of an unknown species? We'll come back to uh, last. Let's, uh, let me play an example for the skeleton. For the relative length of the femur and humerus, right? So relative length is like, what is happening to the femur, femur with respect to the humerus, right? In terms of adaptations. For the cats, for the alligator, and I, I don't have a salamander as an example over here. I think I had, no, I, I don't think I have a salamander as an example for the display. But um, if you want to look it up and adapt it, that, that's completely up to you, but you don't have to. Um, for those creatures, the relative length of the femur and the um, humerus is one-on-one. -on -one. Humerus is not longer than the femur right? For flying animals, for bats and birds, right? Um, the femur is four to five times longer than, uh, sorry, the humerus is four to five times longer than the femur. Again, humerus is four to five times at least longer than the humerus, uh, th than the femur. Keep mixing that up. It makes sense, right? Both of them have wings, bats and birds, right? What, what limb has become the uh, wing? Front limbs, right? So it is a humerus that has become longer, right? Um, and in terms of adaptations, right? Um, for, for, for alligators or for the, yeah, for the, for the alligator, um, do alligators run, guys? I'm just asking a question. It's a different, there's a difference between running and walking, okay? Right? When you are walking, how many of you are actually athletes, college athletes or high school athletes? You might know the difference between running and walking. Yeah, I think it's just like the, you're, when you're running, both feet have to be off the ground for a certain amount of time. When you're walking, one foot always has to be on the ground. Correct. Actually, when you are walking, one foot, completely touches the ground, the entire literally foot, right? From the, uh, you know, like from, from the toes to the back end, right? Should completely land on the ground, 
right? When you are running, you you know that you could be you, you that that moment may not exist exit right you know like because you might actually you know like in you know you touch on your the um the heel right and then gradually you lift the heel off right when your toes touch the ground your heel is off the ground right so so that's actually um the basic difference right and there is a moment when you are running that you are completely off the ground that's actually called galloping that form of a running, right? Um, now, the question back to you is, do alligators run? I think they can. They, they do. They actually run. There are videos. When I teach audit anatomy, I actually show this really ridiculous video where they run, right? When they walk, their belly, they, they, they drag their, they could drag their belly on the ground because they are so lazy. But uh, when they run, they lift their entire body off the ground, including the tail, and they freaking run. And it is hilarious. <laughs> um, Does the same go for crocodiles or are yes. they too big? No, they do. Well, you, you're, you're right. They're huge. But can crocs run? Yes. I've only seen like um, I, like the, the saltwater crocodiles, like the big, really big ones that like are in Australia. I've seen them like move very quickly, but I've never like seen it. Like I didn't really think it count counted as like a run. Yeah, they, they do actually, they do. Yeah. It's not that common to see them. The reason is again, they are big animals. They have less reason to run. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, gators are much smaller, right? So they actually need to uh, run. But yeah, um, Ali, uh, um, crocs do run actually. There are very rare documentation where they could run. Particularly if they want to actually like, you know, uh, go towards a ma an animal that actually is ready to get out from water, you know, uh, yeah, they, they could run. They are hilarious. So, um, so what kind of adaptations do you see for running and walking if you're picking an alligator or, or, you know, or we don't have a croc skeleton, unfortunately. Um, Right. So think about how they walk, right? They're actually heavy bodied animals, right? Um, they have shorter limb legs, right? Shorter arms, right? Their shank is shorter, their thigh is shorter, right? Their arms are shorter, right? But they are heavier, they are heavily built. Those bones are very heavily built, although they are shorter, right? Um, what they also have is actually a longer tail, right? So they have a series of Caudal vertebrates, right? That actually helps them to balance themselves uh, when they are walking, right? The same thing regarding even a cat. The tail plays a part in their locomotion. Frogs, well, their mode of the primary mode is jump, secondary mode is swimming, right? Um, some frogs do hop, toads hop more, but there are some frogs that actually have very short limbs, they hop, right? Um, so leap or jump is a good answer in this part. Swimming, mention it as a secondary one. So the adaptation is actually they have very large hind limbs compared to their front limbs. As a result, their femur is going to be much longer, about three times longer, right? Uh, than the human, uh, sorry, their, um, their, yes, their humerus is much longer than um, their femur. So, yeah, that's it. And, and then, of course, there are sometimes, uh, if, if certain frog or a toad happen to have equal lens in their limbs, um, then they actually are the hoppers, right? Uh, actually, walking is harder for a frog to do, right? Tree frogs, by the way, is an exception. They can walk, right? I mean, because why? Their primary mode of locomotion is not just lump, jumping, but ascending, right? Climbing. It's a primary mode of locomotion for uh, tree frogs. They can walk and they're really funny when they walk, right? But they can also jump. Um, that's why jumping is most important, right? And then, um, so those are actually some of the examples I, I can give you. And you have to populate um, uh, three characters over here um, with respect to the skeletal system. Um, I have, the way I explain these things, you can actually use those to find other 
sort of adaptations, right? I mean, you can go on the local, uh, talk about the flight part a lot more uh, when it comes to birds or bats. Don't pick both of them, one or the other, right? And you can talk about how the digits have modified, right, in these animals, right? Where do you have elongated digits? Where you have shortened digits, right? Um, Mm. Yeah, so basically, I think um, that's actually all I have to give you over there. Let's look at the last one. Don't forget, complete the table using your notes from your species list. Remember the species list you can be, you have been populating uh, in your lab notebook. Observations from the scientific key and your textbook, right? Uh, I don't know how important your textbook is for this part but the, um, the key is going to be important. Record this information on your lab note uh, lab notebook. So this part, um, make it first on your lab homework and then carry it on to your lab notebook. Um, so, Spongy, um, Look at the key that you uh, that I just skipped over, right? And and you know, copy and paste the scientific name, right? For sponges and the uh, the jellyfish or, or, or the other cnidarian, right? Classification: phylum, well, cnidarian and porifera. Feeding method: now, sponge feed how? What is their only method of uh, feeding? Filter feed. Yeah, filter feeders, right? And then um, for cnidarians, regardless of what the group what group they are. Who are they? How do they feed? They're predatory? Yeah, predators, correct, right? Cell structures and organs digestion, in that case, think, you know, holistically. Cells, yeah, choanocytes versus uh, cnidocytes, right? And other structures, you know, um, the spongocele, right? What, what does the spongocele do, right? The function of the amoebocytes moving digested par uh, food particles, right? And then um, for the cnidarian side, well, what kind of organs do they use for foraging? Tentacles are a part of that. Arms, you know, that they have are a part of that. Um, Cnidocytes uh, are a part of that, right? Um, and they have a mouth, don't forget that, right? And they have this, uh, the body cavity inside the mouth that actually has digestive functions. So don't forget those parts. Um, structure of material used to maintain shape. Well, for the sponge, what is the only thing that actually helps them to maintain their body shape? What their quote unquote skeleton is made out of what? Start with S. Spicules. Correct, spicules. Um, and for the Cnidarians, well, some Cnidarians actually can secrete calcium carbonate based skeletons, right? Like the coral reefs, right? They can, but otherwise it's it's simply their body wall, right? Um, and through tissues, well, only one of them have through tissues. It's yes or no, right? And diploblast, triploblast. Well, again, I, I think if you go back to my um, background slide, you have the answer right there. Uh, or if it is applicable, you know, some of them, you know, one of them, you know, may not, the, the, the germinal layers may not apply to them. Well, that's basically all in terms of what uh, today's lab is about. Still, we have about 15, uh, 20 minutes to answer any questions you guys have. So are we still going to have you for lab after the practical? Oh, yeah. Good point. In uh, some of you are in my lecture too, right? Um, so in the lecture, I am disappearing. But just for the record, guys, if you have any questions regarding, you know, before your final exam, you know, want to have any question regarding the super part, I am not unavailable. I'm available, but we have to fix a time to talk about those um, because then that that morning hour, uh, Dr. Paget will use that. So you might need to keep that morning hours for yourself. Uh, for, for, for lecture components, right? But we will email, pick a time and we'll talk. Or we can, if it is a shorter question, email. But if it is, uh, if you require lengthy uh, support, more than happy to do that, we'll do it, right? We will do it.
Um, for example, if you are on the 8 a.m. part, we can do it in the um, 9.15 slot. So no problem in terms of a meeting outside, right? Tuesdays are better for me. So I encourage that we meet on Tuesday if you have any lecture questions, but lab, I will continue to be your lab professor as well. Yeah. If you, if you enjoy it, great. If you don't, too bad. I'm not going anywhere any soon. <laughs> Yeah, I will be there. So we start immediately after the practical with plants. Yeah, give me a shout. How many of you are more of animal lovers than plant lovers? Okay, that makes two, uh, at least two of us. Yes, Annie, you? Animals more interesting. They at least move and they do cool and cute things, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're just more similar to us. Right. Um, so helps you understand more about humans too. Plants do cool stuff too, but it's not very noticeable. Like, I mean, the, the things that I find plant really cool is like pitcher plants who actually kill animals, right? So, um, let's, yeah, plants are less interesting to people, but, you know, there's a way to actually, you know, make you like them. So that will be also really fun. And then it's, it's a new experience. Any questions? Yeah, I will be. Yeah, I'm here. I'm, I'm a more of an animal biologist, but I do have a very strong plant background. Okay, so if you don't have any questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, I'm going to uh, send you guys away, right? If you have any questions, we want to just talk one-on-one. -on -one. You can stay behind. Otherwise, guys, uh, we are done with the animal part. Good luck with the practicals. Wait, I have one more question about the, about the exam. Oh, yeah, it, go ahead. Uh, is it just going to be multiple choice or is it going to be some... All of them, all the required questions are multiple choice. The bonus questions are, uh, you know, you have to write an answer, like a short answer. Okay. Yeah. Good question. And when is the practical again? Again, the practical is going to be next week, Thursday, okay. um, the same time during the lab. Just to be on the safe side, I have scheduled the practical to open up 15 minutes before the actual practical time. So 10.45 instead of 11. And next week what's due is the, is the practical, the this assignment and the lab notebook, right? Yes, 100% correct. So doing the homework is like studying for the practical by the way, you know, so it's not a waste. Are we just going to send you the presentation or is it going to be like? The presentation, uh, Monique, um, the, the actual poster is not due. What is due is actually the, the family tree information. Okay. That you send upload via Blackboard. So only one person uploaded? That's correct. That's going to be as simple as a Word document that simply answers what I'm expecting. If you go back to the poster presentation PDF, Again, on the blackboard, it tells you all I need. All you have to do is just make a Word document, upload it over there, right? Um, not an email, it's actually an upload. Like you go to blackboard, there is a particular thing called all assignments, blah, 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 click that. And inside that folder, there is a link to upload that. So Monique, if you are the team leader for that, you upload one, make sure to mention everybody's name, right? And make sure you have all the information I expect um, that's it. And, and again, if you have any questions regarding that, still you have time um, from today up until um, tonight. Okay. From this, yeah, from this moment up until 11.59 uh, p.m. So, Thank you. Have a good afternoon. Hi, right, James. Oh, hey, James. Um, oh. um, I can... Oh, uh, the, yeah. the, the, the favor you asked, I mm -hmm. think I can do it, so don't worry about it. All right, cool. I am still going to um, contact the registrar, though. Do that. Do that. Uh, why don't you do that and let me know as well? And, and can you email me back the deadline for it? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. I guess um, there really is no deadline. Um, it's just because, like, I've already submitted most of it. It's just, like, as soon as you can, I guess. Okay, because, like, uh, uh, will it be okay if I get it done before the end of the next week? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, I think sure. That's Definitely. Fine. If you... 
please do remind me an email sometime next week because there's a like of shit, like my plate is overflowing but that's not a big deal like i mean i just have to look up your grade from blackboard and do that <laughs> don't worry i get it i've been i'm like swamped with a ton of stuff yeah. too yeah so just just remind me that i i you know but 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 i can do it and then let me know what the registrar office says okay all right yeah, I will. perfect great perfect all right buddy have a good one yeah you too buddy yeah all right any question from between three of you no, I think I'm good. Thank you right. very, very much. Have a great day. Bye, Jeff. Bye. I don't think um, I have any other questions. You do um, not? All right, Emily. Yeah, any? I have one quick one for the pre the, the thing that's due tonight. Yeah. So I think we're just, for my group, I think we're plugging the information into the actual poster. What exactly did you want us to present, like to submit tonight instead? Yeah, let me show you. Let me, okay. let me actually, yeah. I briefly went over that last week, but let me. I'm uh, in the same group, so I guess I should stay. <laughs> I mean, you know, Jaya, what actually we, you guys did last time? Photo projects. Open this up and then share the screen with you guys. Share screen. That one. Um, okay. So all we need. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Come on. So on page two of this PDF that is actually on uh, on Blackboard says um, um, inside the poster folder, right? Well, all you need is A, identify your family, including its domain, kingdom, phylum, class, yada, yada, yada. That's number one. Number two, no, oh, B, list the number of genera it contains. Not every member by name, how many, just a number. Is it five? Is it 10? That's all. Um, and then um, list four features, unique features for the lineage. Remember me, Annie? Uh, what, what, what is it? Uh, what family are we working on? Um, we're working on like the tang sturgeon fish uh, thing. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So the features unique to those sturgeons. Right, that particular group. You know, for example, one thing immediately comes into my mind is the the type of scales they have. Mm -hmm. Those rhomboid shaped scales that actually sort of um, hinges with each other. That's a very unique feature to that particular family. If you don't have it already, that's something you can put down. So make sure, guys, that um, that feature you pick is unique to the family you are studying, right? It should not be something that they share common with the entire order. It shouldn't be something that they share in common with the entire class, right? The more unique it is to the lineage, the better that is, right? Um, and the last is, now you have a sturgeon family and there are, what is the two sister families related to your family. Make sure you list families, not orders. How do you do that is Google for the, um, whatever the family name of the uh, of the sturgeons, phylogenetic tree, right? Then you are actually looking at the phylogenetic tree, not of the family. Don't look at the phylogenetic tree of the sturgeon family, right? Look at the, phy look at the phylogenetic tree of the order to which sturgeons belong to, right? If you look at the one A, I want you to mention the order. Type this particular order, phylogenetic tree. Then you will actually get a phylogenetic tree um, where you actually have the sturgeon family and other members of the same family, right? So pick the two family, uh, three families that is closely related to the sturgeons. Okay. Yeah, that's um, actually, that's it. That's very simple. Uh, and uh, Annie, if you guys have actually already, you know, started filling your actual poster, which is great, which is a brilliant idea. Um, this is simply copying and pasting. Okay, yeah. I, <laughs> right? that thing. I think we can, yeah. I was just going to say, I don't think it's going to be much of a problem for us to just switch it over to like a Word document and submit it. Not at all. Uh, seems like you are we, we are sort of ahead of uh, the curve. So okay. yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was going to ask, we have, we have this stuff, but also a bunch of other things we had already put down. Yeah. That's okay. I'm going to, when I grade, I'm going to only, this, that's a good point you mentioned. If you wanted me, if you want to add additional information so that I can check whether they are right or wrong, do that, right? Because I can make sure before the poster that you have the right stuff. So if you have wrong stuff, you will not lose points for those additional stuff. 
right? But I will only determine your grade based on what uh, on on um, these four parts, right? Again, I don't deduct too much points for having the wrong one, but if it is completely wrong, for example, I ask for families, but you list orders, that will be a big uh, a point loss, right? It's only nine points, by the way, 15% of the entire presentation grade. Um, so, but, um, but, uh, but, but having additional information, uh, that will not be a harm. And I will make sure that you put in the right information if you do. Okay. Yeah, that will help you guys, so. Yeah, but make sure like you have the additional info information separately and the, the mandatory information separately, right? For example, let's say this, right? I only asked for um, four unique features. You list 10. Great. Chances are you might get a, I can help you to find four <laughs> that actually is uh, correct and, and help you to eliminate that what are the ones that are irrelevant or uh, not correct. So. Okay. Um, All right. Good. Jared, um, one quick question for Jared. Do you do you know what time you want to submit this by? I have no clue. No. Okay. So I should be done by. I should be done putting in. I'll create like a word document and share it with you and Jasmine, and then I'll. I should have mine done by like five. So if everything's in there at that point, you can just submit it. We already have one. It looks like I think that Jasmine started one and shared it with us. Yeah, that's she, like the actual poster though, I feel. I feel like she's done like the poster where you plug in like the pictures and everything in that one. No, 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 that's all three. Um, I didn't open the, the second doc that she shared. So maybe that's why. She has a Word document, a midterm stats update in a poster and Okay, so poster yeah, I don't have, I'll, put it, I'll just plug everything in there then. The, yeah. the, the poster confused. Why is it like more than half chi uh, cheetahs? Uh, that's the example that he gave. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah those are the, 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 um, you have to delete those, right? And, and fill in your information. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. I was like, I was 90% sure we had a fish. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I, I went in there first and I was like, is this ours? And I was like, oh, it's the examples. Yeah, I, I mentioned that, but that happened like the day one, I think, or the day two. Yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, but you might forget, wait, who did this? One fish, like one of the fish that I, I was going to put in there to replace that one, he's basically like a clear. It's like see-through almost. It's weird. Oh, nice. Nice. Oh, another thing, actually, if you want to, since it's a fish, Annie, um, mm -hmm. if you want to show like an, a live video of that, Okay. Right. You can do mm -hmm. it. So, um, and if you want to actually like, you know, make sure that, you know, like between this, so now be between submission of the um, preliminary information and the actual poster, you have a lot more time to go back and forth with me and make sure that everything is right. Particularly if I pick something wrong, right? So make sure that don't finish the communication between me and you guys just by this preliminary report. Continuously ask me, is this right? Can I add this? Can I show this as an additional material? Like the clear fish thing, if you want to show me that beforehand, go for it. Because, you know, the more you talk, the more you earn uh, points uh, at the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, was it Emily, you, that you actually asked me whether you can show a video? Yeah. 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 All right, guys, then um, we do have time if you have any questions. I'm all set, so thank you for clarifying that. Absolutely. Okay. I think that um, I'm good for now for um, at least what we have to submit for tonight. All right. All right, buddy. I'm going to close the session for all of you. I'll, I'll uh, see you around. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a great day. Yeah, you too.